Good afternoon and welcome to part four of the CIM New Brunswick Branch Virtual Event Series on an Emerging Gold District in Southwestern New Brunswick. Today our presenters will give an update on the Clarence Stream Project Update, as well as Cape Spencer and Hawkins Love Gold Project Exploration Update plans for 2021. My name is Holly Stewart. I'm the Director of the Resource Development Branch with the Department of Natural Resources and Energy Development. I'll be your moderator today. Thank you for joining us. Some housekeeping before we get started. If you joined with your computer audio, make sure you selected the computer audio button on your control panel. The meeting duration will be approximately one hour. Each speaker will present for approximately 20 minutes, followed by a five minute Q&A. Once both speakers have presented, there will be an opportunity to continue discussions at the end for those who wish to remain in the meeting. Attendees will be muted during the presentations. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the question box in the control panel. These questions will be addressed at the end of each presentation. And at the end of each presentation, you may also use the raise hand function to be unmuted to ask your question. We are pleased to inform you that the presentations will be recorded and available soon. Our first speaker today is Rob Richard. Rob is a field manager with Galway Metals and will be giving an update on the Clarence Stream project. Welcome, Rob. All right, thank you all for attending the CIM session today. I'll be giving an update on the Clarence Green Project located in southwestern New Brunswick, a project that Galway Metals holds. Uh, here's just our forward-looking statement. Uh, you've seen all these before. If you want to read it in detail, you can look at this on our website. Uh, here's just a quick snap of our capital profile. Uh, Galway Metals were well-funded for 2021 uh, I think this was back in the first quarter, we had $24 million cash in the bank. That's probably a little less right now. We have six drill rigs uh, on the go uh, for uh, probably about six months now, or a little more than six months now, probably over, over a year we've had the six rigs going. Um, here's some of their institutional shareholders. Uh, Eric Sprott's one of the mo most well-known uh, kind of market institution guys a lot of people follow. Our board of directors, Robert Hincliffe, Michael Sutton, the VP Exploration, and Larry Strauss, our corporate development VP. And we have a really strong board of technical advisors. So to talk today, we're gonna to be going over the Clarence Stream deposits. I'm um, just gonna quickly show the location, uh, where, we're, where the Clarence Stream deposit is uh, located in relation to other deposits in the Appalachian Gold Trend. We'll touch on the regional geology of the Clarence Stream deposits, and then uh, go over our current resources at the north and south zones. After that, we'll uh, take a glimpse out of our regional anomalies that we'll probably do some follow-up drilling on this summer. Uh, then we'll kind of zoom into the western part of the Clarence Stream and look at some of the targets there. And then, uh, then we'll kind of do a little more zoom in by the north zone. We have lots of soil anomalies around there. Moving on to the discovery zones that we've, uh, the four discovery zones we've found since 2017, which include the George Murphy, Adrian zones, Jubilee zones, and Richard zones. And then uh, we'll follow up just with our plans for 2021-2022. So Right here is the Clarence Stream deposit, about 65 kilometers of uh, land position in uh, southwestern New Brunswick. It's loaded, located 30 kilometers uh, northeast of St. Stephen and about 14 kilometers uh, southwest from the Mount Pleasant tailings and facility. So <clears throat> right in the center here is the Clarence Stream deposit. Uh, this is a 
a map of the Appalachian Gold Trend showing the different terrains. We got the Maguma terrain in Nova Scotia to the south. Uh, north of that, we're into the Avalon terrain. And uh, north of that, we're into the Dunnage and Gander zones, which the Clarence Stream deposit is located in. You can see some of the other important uh, gold deposits in, uh, in the Atlantic provinces. You got the first mining with Hope Brook, Maritime with the Hammer Down, Anaconda's Pine Cove, uh, Rambler, the MIG Mine, and some of the newer projects that have been getting developed over the past three, four years. Maritime's Valentine Lake and the Newfound Gold Queensway project. The map to the right just shows uh, kind of the Appalachian trend with some of the other important uh, deposits on the other side of the other side of the pond. So here's the current claim holdings for Galway in uh, New Brunswick. In the past six months, we've uh, acquired uh, Oak Bay and Lily Hill down in the southwest corner, as long as, as well as uh, Wilson Hill, we just optioned from uh, one of our local prospectors here. And we've also recently staked a little bit of claims in the eastern part of the Clarence Stream project. You can see over in the eastern part here, we got lots of nice little chip samples and grab samples up to 17 grams per ton. There's not a whole lot of drilling done over in the Eastern sector here. Uh, we're still doing a little bit more uh, soil work and ground, ground field work and prospecting over in the East. Our main focus so far for drilling has been over in the Western part of our Clarence Stream project. And uh, you can see our, the, the first zone that was found would have been the South zone over here, follow up that was what Free, Free West Resources first drilled it and then they they also discovered the North Zone. And since uh, Galway took over, we got the George Murphy Zone, Richard Zone, Jubilee Zone, and the Adrian Zone, as well as a couple new drill hole discoveries within the past few months. Um, one located just to the west of the Adrian Zone, and the other one is located to the southwest of Jubilee. So here's a closer look at the Western block. Uh, we now have over 71,000 soil samples in our uh, soil sample database. Um, we plan on doing another 8,000 soil samples this year. Uh, you can see it covered the soil soil grids cover a large portion of our of our property here. Uh, you can see the scale over here. So anything in yellow is over seven grams per or seven ppb. Sorry, gold. Uh, in the orange, we're in the 10 to 15, and in the red, uh, greater than 15. And our, our best soil sample to date was uh, actually just a little over one gram per ton, 1,030 ppb. And uh, that was located along this, this trend here, the Sawyer Brook Fault trend, where, where um, four, four of the drilled off deposits are located in quite close proximity to. Uh, the exception being the, the north zone, which is a, considered a distal deposit. Um, you can see all the, all the intrusions here, uh, the mafic intrusions and the dots and uh, kind of the felsic intrusions uh, here. So here you got your macadavic granite, which is associated with the mineralization at the south zone and possibly uh, related to uh, all the zones. Uh, we're just not fully certain that mineralization at uh, the newer zones are directly related to the Macadavic. You got the Soil Ridge Granite, Pleasant Ridge Granite. There's a new on-map granite, it's not on our maps, on the government maps yet, that over at Wilson Hill. And then we also found another one at the Richard Zone right here. That's pretty hard to see. Uh, so this is the longitudinal section of the South Zone. Uh, this dark line here kind of shows the proposed pit outline at the south deposit. Um, here are some of the different grades, some of the drill holes, 11 grams per ton over 12 meters, 7 grams per ton over 12, 17 over 5. Lots of good grades over at the Clarence Stream South Zone. Um, it's still open at depth and a long strike. Um, and we, uh, we feel that uh, the you know, we, we can uh, upgrade the, the resource on the south, south zone pretty easily with more drilling. 
uh, here's the current resource. So we have a 0.74 million ounce equivalent, um, which was last updated in 2018. Um, for gold ounces itself, there's 660,000 ounces of gold, plus an additional 22,000 uh, ounces of antimony equivalent. Uh, here's just the notes on the Maryland resource. Again, you can just get this on our company website. Just gives you the cutoffs and uh, calculations of what prices were used. Um, so now we're going to move on to the North Zone. The North Zone has a measured and indicated resource of 1.6 million tons at 1.98 grams per ton gold, and uh, which equals 103,000 ounces of gold plus some uh, antimony credits. And the inferred resource is 1.8 million tons at 2.09 grams per ton gold. And uh, that equals 123,000 ounces uh, plus additional antimony credits. Um, here you can see kind of in white the little pit outlines um, are proposed for the North Zone. We have kind of three pits proposed. And what's important to note is all these other soil anomalies. You can see the in the dark red here, this is uh, probably this, you know, likely the soil anomaly associated with the North Zone currently. Uh, and then to the north of there, we have all these untested uh, zones of uh, golden soils. So we, we hope to follow up on some of these anomalies here this summer and fall and uh, see, see if we can find anything up, up there. So now what we've been working on since 2007 is uh, our discovery zones. So to the northeast, we get the Adrian zone. That's uh, pretty much the most recent zone that has been found. Uh, the first zone we found in uh, 2007 would have been the George Murphy zone. Uh, we had drilling ongoing there from uh, October 2017 right till December 2018. In December 2018, uh, we decided to test another soil anomaly. We had the Jubilee deposit over here that was discovered uh, in, the, in the late 90s, early 2000s. And then we had our newly found George Murphy zone. So we had some soil anomalies in between the two. We wanted to check to see if, uh, see if we had more zones in the middle. And sure enough, our first drill hole which was located right in between Jubilee and George Murphy actually intersected, uh, it was, it would have been BL, BL12. Uh, that one there intersected uh, 7.3 grams per ton over 36.65 meters. And since then, uh, we've just expanded a long strike to the Northeast and to the Southwest and pretty much connected uh, the George Murphy zone with the Jubilee zone and uh, Follow-up dr drilling now is actually kind of connected the George Murphy zone with the Adrian zone, which is uh, pretty impressive. It's about a, you know, three kilometer or 2.4 to, I think, or sorry, a four kilometer long trend uh, from the Western edge of Jubilee all the way up to uh, the Northeastern end of Adrian. And you can see here, this is all just different grades. So just a long strike, a consistent high grade, a high grade uh, intercept over good meters, uh, 13 grams over 12 meters, 4.8 over 34. I'm not going to rhyme them all off, but you can see like from one, one edge of the deposit to the other, with like, you know, the western edge of uh, Jubilee, we got 1.9 grams over 43.3 meters. Um, so great grades over uh, the entire strike of the deposit. There's a couple little gaps, um, but for the most part, it's all connecting up. And uh, you can see here the, the little pink zone. So these are kind of the surface trace of the, of the different veins. And it, as you can see at the, the Jubilee, there's a couple stack veins. Richard, there's three or four stack veins. And uh, over at the George Murphy Adrian, there's uh, multiple stack quartz veins. Um, so this is the same map just showing uh, our soil and anomalies that are related to the deposits. So you can see in red here is the higher soil anomalies, the pink as well. Um, here's the soil anomalies associated with George Murphy and Adrian zone up here. And now, uh, you know, you can see there's not a whole lot of drilling on any of these other, other soil anomalies. 
Um, right now, you can see the mag. Magnetics is the background. This is a new mag study we would have flew uh, last year. And you can notice all the deposits are in the mag low and the blue. They kind of follow right in those mag low trends. So that's one of our high target areas is where we get uh, mag lows and good soil anomalies. Um, you can see up on the, here's the new granite we found at the Richard zone. There's a couple little outcrops. This doesn't show the exact surface expression, but it kind of shows the expression at depth where we've intersected and drill holes. Um, we haven't tested anything on the northwestern side of this granite. Um, there is lots of good high gold anomalies here. And just to the north along the Sawyer Brook Fault, we also get some uh, good, go good gold anomalies into the to the north northwest over here. Another good gold anomalies that we haven't tested yet. Um, one of the newer discoveries, we got 4.8 grams per ton gold over 3.1 meters associated with this uh, soil anomaly up here, which is near contact with the uh, Sorrel Ridge granite. And then down to the southwest, uh, you know, almost uh, uh, five, 600 meters from our last intercept at Jubilee, we actually got a really high grade, uh, 186.5 grams per ton over six meters associated with this soil anomaly here. So a lot more drilling, drilling to go uh, just in this little small area here. So now we're gonna zoom into the George Murphy and Adrian zones. Uh, so the discovery of the George Murphy zone was kind of located right, right around this area here. Um, and uh, right from the beginning, you know, we were getting multiple, multiple zones of uh, Quartz and sericite altered host rock with our xenopyrite and we know there's a lot of EG in the core. And uh, here you can see, you know, one, two, three, four, five different stack veins that are all continuing over a good strike length. And again, here's just some of the grades you can see, you can read them, you know, 24 grams over six, 74, 78 grams. Um, over to the east here, this is a big step out we did is uh, 400 meters kind of from the last hole over here. So we have all this gap to fill in too. And we got 9.4 grams per ton over, over half a meter. So we're expecting these veins to continue along. We haven't done any, any testing between these holes over here too to the north. I'm, I'm hoping uh, you know, we'll, see it, we'll see these veins extend to the southeast and to the northwest as well. Uh, Again, here's just the, the soil anomaly from the George Murphy zone showing, you know, some untested anomalies. There's the discovery zone, new discovery zone here with the soil anomaly. Um, there's some untested soil anomalies all over the place here. Uh, here's a simplified cross section of the George Murphy zone. So most of the mineralized veins are all hosted in this uh, metamorphosed siltstone corderite sediment package. Um, there's a little bit of a conglomerate in here that appears to be folded. You kind of get a couple intercepts and a few different holes. Uh, it's generally fairly thin, only uh, anywhere from one meters to 10 meters thick. Um, you do have a couple veins kind of associated with the conglomerate near the contacts. And there is a little uh, gabbromaphic dike in here. Uh, sometimes it's mineralized, sometimes it's not. Uh, that pretty much depends, I think, if, you know, the structure is kind of going going through there um, you can see you know we have veins over 300 meter width and you know down to a depth of over 300 meters is you know some of our deeper intersections here so a lot of the resources up in the pitable area for the george murphy zone that we've drilled so far we've mainly tested uh, you know the first uh, 300 meters here's just a picture of the drill core uh, so this is the uh, hole 36 at the George Murphy zone from 54 meters to 63, so not very deep. You know, we get 13 grams per ton over 8.7 meters, which included 201 grams per ton over half a meter, which you can see this, this is the 201 gram vein right there. Um, lots of quartz, you can see some sericite alteration in here. Uh, multiple multiple veins, all carrying mainly arsenopyrite, pyrite, and some physical gold. Just another picture. Here's uh, another one of the George Murphy zone hole 84. Just beautifully scattered with gold. These that's one millimeter here, so the field of view is six millimeters. So you get you know 
good splashes of gold, almost half a meter uh, across. And there's a little bit of arsenal pyrite within the quartz as well. Um, up to the Adrian zone, the, the one of the newest zones we've uh, just discovered. Uh, this is down a little bit deeper, 243 meters down hole. It created 12.95 grams per ton over 13 meters, which included a 50.5 gram per ton and a 78.9 gram per ton, which are these two sections here that you can see have been quartered. So this is a George Murphy Adrian zone composite. So this is a, you know, uh, has shows lot all of, all the intersections. You can see, you know, there's lots of high grade up here, close to surface in the in the pitable areas. Uh, so, you know, we're thinking these deposits all can be mineable open pit with high grades and thick thick widths of some of these veins. Now on to the Jubilee Richard zone. Um, again, here you can see our multiple veins going. Um, at our Jubilee and Richard zones. Great grades across the entire strike length again. Like I said, there's a couple tiny gaps, but they're not very big. One right here and uh, another one over on the eastern side right here, but they're pretty small gaps. Overall, the grades are pretty high. You get some real thick ones too. So, you know, 3.5 grams per ton over 40 meters. Uh, 7.3 grams per ton over 36, 97 uh, grams per ton over 15 meters, 1.9 grams per ton over 43 meters. So really high grades, really thick intercepts. So, you know, we're hoping once we do get the resource, which I, I believe we're going to try to get out in the third quarter right now, it should uh, bump up the resource uh, quite nicely with once, once we get all this drilling into a updated resource. And so here's the soils on that same map. Again, you know, you see most of the deposits are in the mag low. All the soil anomalies are down ice of the deposits, which would you expect here in southern New Brunswick. And here's a cross section of the restored zone, uh, just showing multiple stack veins dipping down, dipping to the to, to the south, um, very similar to the George Murphy and Adrian zone. Uh, here's just a little bit of cross-section on the geology. Here we get the granite. We see it's kind of a steep contact on that granite contact. Uh, multiple stack, stacking veins all dipping to the south. And here's a picture of the core of the Richard zone, hole 101 from 136 to 174. We got 6.2 grams over 38 meters. You see the beautiful quartz veining, highly altered uh, wall rock here. And uh, this section down on the left of your screen there, we got 373 grams per ton over half a meter um, and with some beautiful visible gold. Here's the composite for the Richard zone long section. So the, the triangles are vein A, which be located kind of to the, the southerly most vein. Vein B is the main vein we've been drilling off, although we get all three intercepts on most of our drill holes. Um, and then vein C, the furthest vein to the to the north on the Richard zone. Uh, these are your grade times width, so 50 to 499. Um, so essentially, that'd be like one gram over 50 meters would be the the base. So again, a lot of our high grade is right along here, all within our pitable limits. And uh, here's one of the little gaps I was talking about. We get some low grade gold in here, but you know our we kind of get this nice high grade platter section along the Richard zone. And then we have a nice high grade shoot uh, a little bit further to the west. Um, so this kind of showing the three veins, just kind of grade times with contours. Um, so vein A, vein B, vein C. You see vein B is the one we've been uh, focusing on, getting, the, getting folks in main drilling on here. Big hurt high grade zone going there. And then there's that shoot you, you were able to see too. And then some of the other little high grade zones on the other veins. Uh, this is the Jubilee zone, some gold, the Jubilee zone. This is uh, one of our westernmost holes on the Jubilee. He's really heavy Arsino pirate and some beautiful visible gold. 
And uh, so for 2021, a clearance stream, we are expecting to drill an additional 100,000 meters or greater than 250 holes, which is gonna focus on expanding our existing zones. And also uh, we're gonna try to find some new discoveries with all those soil anomalies we have. Um, lots of drill targets adjacent to the recent discoveries at the George Murphy zone, Richard zone. And uh, there's a few more gaps to fill in, but they're, uh, they're uh, almost done filling in the gaps now. Now we'll be kind of expanding along the lengths. Um, like I said, our best, best drilling targets are where we get some good uh, golden soil. Uh, arsenic and antimony are also good uh, geochemical in soil anomalies especially where we know they're related with those magnetic lows. Um, we're also hoping to make some new discoveries at our newly acquired properties at Oak Bay, Lily Hill, and Tower Hill. And uh, there's also that we have a four kilometer long uh, golden soil anomaly west of Jubilee, which we haven't tested yet. Uh, I'm really hoping we get to uh, test some of that this year. Another thing we're going to do this year on the Richard and GMZ zones, we're going to do some trenching where we have the zones projected at surface and uh, hopefully for the first time actually get to see those zones uh, at surface. So that's what I'm really looking forward to this summer. Uh, again, we're going to take some additional 8,000 soil samples. That'll bring us up to almost 80,000 soil samples in our, uh, in our soil compilation right now. We're going to try to update our resource in the third quarter, which will include the GMZ, the George Murphy Zone, Adrian Zone, Richard Zone, and Jubilee Zone, none of which have been in the resource yet. We've started metallurgical and ore sorting tests. Uh, right now, we're drilling some uh, metallurgical holes in uh, PQ size, which is really large diameter core. And then all this uh, is going to go towards our preliminary economic uh, assessment, uh, which we hope to have in uh, 2022. That's what we're working towards. And if you have any questions, uh, please just uh, contact me at uh, richardrockport at gmail.com. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rob. Great presentation. Now we're ready for a couple of minutes of Q&A. Ron Hawks, please go ahead. Oh, you're muted, Ron. Have we gotten muted now? Good. Yes. Okay, thanks. Uh, I noticed some of your uh, core was quartered in that. Could you just tell us a little bit about your sampling and assaying uh, uh, methods or challenges and uh, uh, just how you're going about that. Yeah, so uh, for the most part, uh, we uh, cut our core in half. Um, our sampling widths are anywhere from uh, half a meter to a meter and a half. We generally uh, try to rush um, any of the high grade zones we have. Um, and uh, so at first we'll do like uh, just our fire assay plus uh, multi-element would be our first round. And then anything with real high grade will go for the screen metallics. Um, sometimes you'll have enough, if it's a small sample, you'll have enough uh, material, um, you know, 500 grams or 1000 grams, depending which one you do. But we usually always do screen metallics on anything we have with visible gold and, or anything that uh, is higher grade. We usually like to get a screen metallic finish on that. And how and are they with your the quarter, quarter sample? Uh, and well, the quarter samples are, are from for uh, resource estimates. So that's taken by, you know, an outside company that would be doing a resource just to do check samples. Right. Uh, thanks for that. No, no problem. Rob, in the chat, you have a message from Sheila Waters. Can you speak a bit more about the magnetic signatures, what they reflect? I see the granite and Adrian zones seem to unlap onto the linear mag anomalies. Yeah, so a lot of the 
granites and uh, intrusions actually have a mag high signature, but some of them have a mag low signature as we see at the Richard zone there. It's all kind of focusing in those mag lows, but most of those mag lows, we're, some of them are just uh, formational boundaries, but other of them are showing the fault zones. So the Sawyer Brook fault has a mag low associated with it. And there's some parallel, you know, expected parallel faults that are uh, um, all in these mag lows. So the mag lows we're, we're, we're seeing as uh, areas of faulting where, uh, you know, that's our, 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 that kind of better targets for looking for the gold mineralization. Most of the deposits are all, or all the deposits are kind of associated with the mag low, except for, the north zone, which there's still kind of a anomaly there, but that one's a little bit different, flatter lying, so you don't get a as good of a signature up at the north zone. Thank you, Rob. So if you didn't have the opportunity to have your question answered, there will be additional time at the end of both speakers. Our next speaker is David Copeland. David is the Chief Geologist with Anaconda Mining at Magnaterra Minerals. Welcome, David. Thank you very much, Holly. Uh, today, I would like to uh, introduce everyone to uh, Magnaterra Minerals and our projects in, uh, in New Brunswick. Just, uh, try to make this slide should work. Can everyone see that okay? Yes. Great, thank you very much, Holly. Yeah, I'd like to introduce you to Magnaterra Minerals and, and our projects in New Brunswick. Uh, we are um, Magnaterra is an Atlantic Canada focused exploration company. Uh, it was really, uh, it's, it's, Magnaterra has been around for quite a while. Uh, previously, it was focused in Argentina and we, we still have several Argentinian uh, focused gold projects, uh, but really we've we've switched our focus recently to to Atlantic Canada um, through the purchase of of exploration projects in Newfoundland and New Brunswick from Anaconda Mining. And uh, so Magnaterra is deeply you know uh, tied to Anaconda. We share some our management structure and an exploration group. Uh, but really, we're uh, you know we we really shifted focus uh, for the company. Quite excited about um, you know the Atlantic Canada region and uh, leveraging our experience in that area. Uh, the be forward-looking statements in this presentation. Uh, our our team really is is uh, led by Lou Lorick. He's uh, president and CEO. He's also a major shareholder of both Anaconda and Magnaterra. Uh, he's been a longtime investor. Um, you know, again, we share, uh, uh, you know, a lot of similar management uh, personnel, board personnel with, uh, with Anaconda. Bill Francis is, is corporate controller of, of Anaconda and also our, uh, our, our CFO and corporate secretary for Magnaterra. Uh, myself and, and Paul McNeil on the exploration side, uh, quite a bit of experience in, in, uh, in the Atlantic provinces. Um, and we really we share our exploration team, which is is largely Newfoundland based, but we have uh, we have uh, personnel in New Brunswick uh, as well as Nova Scotia. Uh, just a brief touch on on the capital structure. We really reorganized Magnaterra when we we completed the transaction with with Anaconda. Anaconda is a major shareholder um, of Magnaterra, owning about twenty seven percent, and and we have a strong strong management. Uh, shareholder position, um, as well as a lot of institutions and strategic advisors, uh, investors in the company. So a lot of long-term share, shareholding uh, power behind us uh, and a very clean uh, corporate structure. So currently have about a uh, million dollars uh, in flow through uh, available for to fund expiration for this year. Uh, our focus really is why Atlantic Canada. Um, you know, we've been we've been working in Atlantic Canada for quite a while. 
uh, as a group. We've operated the Pine Cove mine in, in, uh, in northeastern Newfoundland for about uh, a little over 10 years now uh, and, and continue to produce at that asset. Um, myself personally, I've been working uh, in Newfoundland for the past uh, 17 plus years. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's long been, you know, it was long said that uh, there weren't a lot of large gold deposits in, uh, in Newfoundland and, uh, and Atlantic Canada. Um, and a lot of that, um, you know, people said that the deposits were small, you're never going to find anything big here. And it, and it was owing to, uh, to the tectonics of the region. Uh, I think what we've seen, you know, certainly in the last decade is that has been proven wrong. Um, you know, with, uh, with, you know, discovery and additional capital uh, investment in projects here, we've seen Valentine Lake grow to 4.2 million ounces. Uh, Clarence Stream is certainly uh, has been a, a strong, you know, strong, uh, you know, um, a story uh, in New Brunswick. We've seen the development of the Moose River mine in, in Nova Scotia. And, uh, and Anaconda's own Goldboro project, which is now uh, at around 2.7 million ounces. So it's no longer uh, a domain of small gold deposits. We're starting to see an accumulation of a lot of, of uh, global ounces uh, within this area. And again, I think that is owing to the, the, um, the, the tectonism and, and the nature of the Appalachians and that they are favorable areas for um, for, for large gold deposits. Uh, that's principally owing to the diversity of the, um, of the tectonic domains. And of course, the, these large extensive uh, terrain bounding fault structures, uh, which are really a common theme amongst all orogenic systems uh, that have been, been found so far. Uh, so we really, we term this the resurgence in Appalachian gold. Um, and a lot of the catalyst for that has been, has been St. Barbara's acquisition of of Moose River for 722 million, which was quite a large deal. Uh, it brought a lot of attention into the region and, and continues to do so amongst all the other good news stories. Uh, Magna Terra's focus is uh, we have three camp scale projects, uh, the Great Northern and Viking projects located in Western Newfoundland, uh, as well as our Cape Spencer and Hawkins Love projects located in south, Southwestern New Brunswick. Uh, we, in total, we have a, an inventory of 405,000 ounces of, of global inferred uh, resources that are 43101 compliant uh, at each of the project sites with the exception of Hawkins Love. Uh, we have 255,000 ounces in compliant resource at our Great Northern project, uh, as well as 83,000 ounces of, of historic resources at Viking. At Cape Spencer in New Brunswick, and, and the focus of my talk today, we we have 150,000 ounces in inferred resources at the, the Cape Spencer mine and the, uh, the Northeast Stone um, next to it. So uh, Magnetera really has a really good base of resources um, within the region. Uh, here's our, our mineral resources tabulated. Uh, all of our, our deposits are essentially outside of the, um, the uh, Northeast Zone. Everything is conceptually open pitable. So, uh, essentially outcrops, uh, grades that are uh, pretty decent open pit grades uh, for most uh, deposits globally. And then the Northeast zone, we have a, a, a small 96,000 ounce uh, underground resource at uh, just over four grams per ton. Uh, you can see in the bottom right corner, that was one of the gold bars that was poured in the 1980s from, uh, by Gordex at the Cape Spencer mine. Um, so again, we have two projects uh, located in Southern New Brunswick, the Cape Spencer project located about 15 kilometers to the east of the city of St. John, uh, all road accessible. Um, and this project is, is really centered along the Millican Lake Fault. Again, lots of terrain bounding faults that transect Southern New Brunswick, very similar to what we see throughout Newfoundland uh, and hinged on these are, are these orogenic gold deposits. Uh, and there's the 151,000 ounces of inferred resource at Cape Spencer. And then our Hawkins Love Project, which is, is a grassroots project uh, in southwestern New Brunswick. Uh, essentially, we view this as the, the mirror image to Clarence Stream geologically. Uh, so we're right up against that boundary, uh, you know, of the, the St. George Batholith with the mass green sediments. 
much of our focus to date has been uh, on uh, the Cape Spencer project. And I'll just dive into the geology uh, a little bit about that. I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with this project. Um, essentially, our focus is on this section of Proterozoic and Cambrian stratigraphy, the Millican Lake Granite in pink, uh, and all its sort of thrust bound um, Cambrian sediments, the, the Cape Spencer formation in the browns and the blues. And that's where we see a lot of the focus for the uh, for gold mineralization in this area. Uh, so there's the Millican Lake Fault, the dashed red line through there. Uh, that's really thought to be the causative structure for much of the, the, the gold bearing fluids. Uh, it bounds basically the, the older stratigraphy with the Carboniferous uh, rocks in gray to the north. Uh, lots of um, sort of deformation history within this area. Lots of different uh, unconformities that uh, that certainly mark a lot of the lithological boundaries through the area. So, um, just a basic cross section. This is more or less from north uh, northwest to southeast uh, through the area. Again, you can see the Carboniferous cover uh, in the different the two shades of gray, and then the you know sort of the overthrust Precambrian basement uh, and its Cambrian. Uh, cover sequence, the, the the Cape Spencer formation in brown. Uh, there's a there's a shot from the uh, Cape Spencer open pit down there, and Rob Richard uh, for scale uh, when I first toured the toured the property with Rob um, from Sheila's work in 1993. Uh, she really outlined four phases of of late Carboniferous deformation: uh, D1 uh, north directed thrusting and isoclinal folding, as well as some open folding within the Carboniferous. Uh, and so it, this really developed this gently southeast dipping foliation through much of this, uh, the Cambrian basement, pre-Cambrian basement. Uh, and then what we see, uh, you know, I think importantly, uh, although we don't fully understand it, is the D2. And, and so they're locally south verging open folds and related thrust faults. Um, but we also see a component of, of northerly verging uh, D2 deformation as well, which uh, I believe is, is critical for... Uh, for, for gold mineralization within the area. Uh, much of our focus uh, has been on the Emilio trend. And, uh, and again, that sits in the central part of the property. Uh, again, we're on this 15 kilometer stretch of the, uh, the Millican Lake Fault. And um, uh, you can see the Cape Spencer mine uh, here to the Southeast. There's 54,000 ounces at 1.71 grams. And then just to the northeast of that is the northeast zone, that underground resource. Uh, so really our focus, um, you know, and what we were most attracted to on the project outside of the resource areas was the Emilio trend. And that's this five kilometer seek, uh, stretch of essentially the same rocks that host the, the resources to the Southwest. Uh, but what we saw is a lot of historic float and outcrop sampling uh, with, uh, with abundant visible gold in quartz veins. Um, this area really wasn't drill tested in the past. Uh, there was, I think there's a total of eight holes in this area, uh, principally of which was the one hole at the Emilio zone that assayed 7.86 grams over 7.4 meters uh, without much follow-up drilling around it. So uh, an opportunity for Magnaterra to go in and make a near-term discovery. Um, again, a bit more on the geology, this is a, a shot uh, from Rob Richard's thesis in, in 2005 of the open pit. I think it's it's quite a bit more overgrown now, uh, but what we can see are the, the several thrust panels uh, that really bound the mineralization and are associated with the mineralization. Uh, and what you see here are alternating uh, panels of Millican Lake granite, uh, sort of in these lighter colors, and then these, these, uh, these Cape Spencer sediments, sort of the darker colors, the rustier colors through there, but multiple um, you know, thrust faults uh, within that, that mineralized area. Uh, just some close-ups of the alteration from the open pit. Uh, what we see, we can see several deformation fabrics within here, but the alteration really comprises pervasive uh, muscovite or illite alteration. Uh, with pyrite that, that seems to be forming uh, through a sulfidization reaction of specular hematite, and then abundant iron carbonate uh, quartz, and, and plus some occasional tourmaline within, within some of the rocks and, and the veins. 
Uh, the illite and iron carbonate defines the main foliation, which I've termed S1 here, perhaps not regionally correct, but it's the earliest fabric that, uh, that you can see within the pit. And you can see that that fabric is folded about these asymmetric, uh, what I've termed F2 folds, that in this case are, are north verging. Um, and then we have D2 thrusts that are associated with the second stage of, of quartz and iron carbonate, as well as hematite veining uh, that we see in the area. Um, some age dating, uh, again from Sheila's thesis in 1993, uh, showed that the illite uh, had ages between 276 and 283 million years. So a Permian age for, for the alteration um, is, is possible. Uh, I think the other thing you can see here is just the heavy um, pyrite stringers, right? And again, associated with the alteration in that area up in that photo uh, to the left. Uh, just some some shots of some rocks here. You can see this is the S1 foliation. These samples were taken from from the open pit, from drill core from the open pit. You can see the the boudinage quartz vein uh, that's that's being refolded about the F2 folds. Uh, you're starting to see good development of a um, an S2 axial planar cleavage and some transposition of the the veins within these uh, these D2 shear zones. Uh, here's just a, a zoom in of the that southwestern part of the property. There's the northeast zone resource projected to surface, and then the open pit resource here, um, again projected to surface, but that, that pretty much outcrops. Uh, what we see is a strong plunge to the northeast zone to the south southwest that seems to be uh, at least parallel to the uh, the hinge of uh, what I think are F2 folds. Uh, so strong plunge component to the mineralization as you can see on this longitudinal section. So here's the Northeast zone in this area, mostly hosted within the Cape Spencer sediments in brown, but just at the contact with the Millican Lake granite. You can see the several thrust panels that form uh, these alternating Millican Lake Cape Spencer formation that have been imbricated uh, throughout time. And then here's the pit zone uh, and all the shallow drilling associated with the pit zone uh, in that area. And then probably what's some late reactivation along the Millican Lake Fault. I, I don't really have a great handle on the on the geometry of this along its length, uh, whether it's you know south dipping or north dipping. Not quite sure, but quite sure that that has been reactivated over time. Uh, just some some examples of drill core here. This is from the um, from the northeast zone in this area right here. Uh, what we commonly see again is there's the Millican Lake granite. You can see the area that's been sampled. I think you get into the Cape Spencer sediments right around here, uh, but basically the alteration bridges that contact. Cape Spencer sediments are more often than not in this area, they are comprised of fine grain clastic sediments, shales and siltstones that are quite pervasively altered. So everything's Ill illite altered through this, through this area, uh, but decent thickness, decent grade, uh, through this resource area, 7.72 grams over 16.2 meters in this particular hole. Uh, and really, and this this kind of goes into what we've been focused on was this this one hole at uh, the Emilio zone at uh, that assay at 7.89 grams over 7.4 meters. Uh, this this is largely hosted in what looks like Millican Lake granite or coarse clastic uh, rocks that are developed upon it. Uh, there's some VG in the core right where it was collared into, uh, and this was collared very close to one of the, uh, the Emilio zone uh, discovery trench. But uh, uh, when we walked into this pretty much open in all directions, um, you know, a nice thick high grade intercept uh, sort of ripe for the, uh, for the picking. Uh, so again, a lot of our, um, a lot of our efforts were, were focused on this Emilio zone. Um, and I think we, you know, we, we did quite a bit of work uh, last fall. Uh, our geological team, uh, Zach McDougall, uh, Sheila Waters, and uh, Luke Marshall did a lot of mapping, uh, prospecting through this area, and we found some, some quite interesting things. Um, you know, principally, we, we did a large soil sample off to the east of that Emilio zone covering the Millican Lake granite. I think one of the biggest takeaways was the importance of these north northeast oriented fault splays uh, that affect the granite uh, through this area. And uh, we found 
quite a bit of visible gold bearing float along that assaying up to 22 uh, grams per ton. And that really was the springboard for us to, to complete a drilling program, um, you know, in the, uh, in the winter. And we just re re released those results uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and so our drill program really focused on this, this sort of Western 1.2 kilometers of that greater Emilio zone uh, trend uh, in that area. So we completed uh, 2,100 meters uh, in 17 holes. A lot of the program was really designed to test the main, um, you know, fault zone through this area between the Cape Spencer granite and the, or sort of Milligan Lake granite, the Cape Spencer formation, and then also test these north northeast oriented fault splays. And, and what we saw was alteration and quartz veining associated with, with these zones. Um, we also tested several other historic trenches throughout the area, so fairly broad step outs, uh, 50 to 400 meter step outs in a lot of cases. And then we follow we followed up in that that one Emilio zone hole uh, in this area with with uh, again lots of step outs along strike. Uh, some of the highlights of the the drilling we did was was 8.8 grams over 0.5 meters in hole eight. That was a down dip follow up on the on the, again that high grade hole hole at Emilio zone, uh, and then 1.49 grams over two meters, and that was that was located 250 meters off to the west of the Emilio zone trench, and that that sort of undercut a historic trench that had some assays um, in that area there. So. Uh, lots of broad alteration, uh, some, you know, lots of disseminated sulfides, pervasive illite alteration through much of it. Uh, we saw malachite, native copper, and, and chalcopyrite through it, uh, and then occasional visible gold in, in some of the, the holes um, that were associated with the uh, drilling. Just to give you a cross section, again, this cross section will be uh, just through the Emilio zone, uh, sorry, in this area through here. Uh, so again, there's that down dip extension in hole eight of that higher grade Emilio zone. This is the trend of the two, two vein systems that we see in this area. So everything hangs together quite well. We extended it 25 meters down dip. Uh, and then just a, an indication of some of the core here. So lots of narrow veins, uh, stockwork veins through this area. Looks to be a, a thin albite rind around some of the quartz veins. Uh, up against this, um, this, this arcosic unit through that area. Uh, moving on to Hawkins Love now. Uh, Hawkins Love we acquired uh, in, in late fall last year. Uh, we're really just getting started on the, um, on the field work right now. But uh, Hawkins Love, again, we, we see this as the, you know, geologically the mirror image uh, for the Clarence Stream deposit on the other side of the St. George Batholith. Um, you know, we're quite, uh, quite excited about this area. There's obviously lots of activity uh, and lots of opportunity for discovery. Um, projects focused along this Wheaton Back Brook uh, Back Bay Fault system uh, through here, uh, and also the St. George Fanning Brook Fault that runs up to the northern end of the property. Uh, we recently staked more claims just to the north uh, as well, uh, based on some, some positive um, results from the field. Uh, geologically, uh, again, we're, we, you know, the Hawkins Love project is, is centered along the Jake Lee uh, mountain granite, uh, that Devonian phase of the intrusion. Here's the larger St. George batholith and the Mount Douglas granite uh, in the various pink colors. Um, the project really sits along this eight kilometer stretch of anomalous soils um, that were really highlighted from patchy sort of grids uh, completed in the past by Naranda. Um, a lot of that mineralization, again, uh, in the soils sits right over the contact between the Jake Lee, Jake Lee granite and these mascarine sediments. So sandstones, felsic volcanics, uh, and mafic volcanics in the various colors here. Um, and again, that's where that back bay fault goes right up through. So quite a large project. Um, we really just started exploration work on that, uh, following up on that soil trend. Um, and uh, so quite excited to get started there on the ground. Uh, our 21, 21 exploration programs, uh, we're, uh, we're currently funded, we have about a million left, uh, currently funded through the summer. Um, our phase one program at Cape Spencer, $350,000. 
uh, we'll collect an additional 3,500 soil samples, really just continuing on from those soils that we saw at the Emilio trend. We're going to complete a large, sorry, a large drone magnetic survey uh, over um, a lot of that Emilio trend, and then follow up mapping and prospecting on all the soil targets that we generated um, late last year. Uh, and then we look forward to a fall drilling program, um, you know, phase two fall drilling program. At Hawkins Love, we're currently collecting 3,500 soil samples over the Emilio trend that's almost complete. Uh, we're relogging historic drill core uh, that's ongoing at the Sussex Core facility. Uh, we're going to complete a drone magnetic survey over a lot of that uh, section as well of the anomalous soils and then mapping and prospecting is, is ongoing. Uh, and then in Newfoundland, we've got, uh, we're currently undertaking a, um, a soil sampling program at, uh, at the Great Northern Project, uh, mapping and prospecting of various targets we have there. And, uh, and we'll complete a summer 2000 meter um, drilling program on that, on that project. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the hard work of Sheila Waters, uh, Luke Marshall, Zach McDougall, uh, Seamus Waters and Tyler Henderson, our staff in New Brunswick, they've, they've worked really hard over the last several, several months and, and are doing a fantastic job. Uh, also like to thank our contractors, Geo Explore, uh, Logan, Logan Drilling and ALS Chemex, um, and also thank the uh, NBJ MAP program for, for funding for some of our exploration programs. Thank you. Thank you, David. Now we're ready for the Q&A. Anybody has questions for David? Okay, if there's no questions for David, I'll open the floor for either Rob or David, if there are any follow-up questions. Hey, thank you to both of our speakers. Up next, uh, our session five will be on Thursday, July 22nd from 12 until one. The speaker will, will be Charles Codors from Brunswick Exploration. And the topic will be the Fundy Gold Project, an overlooked regional fault package in Southern New Brunswick with huge potential and early success. Thank you for attending today. We look forward to you joining us on July 22nd for part five of the CIM New Brunswick branch virtual event series on an emerging gold district in Southwestern New Brunswick. Thank you. <laughs>